In this video, you'll see what happened when I rebuilt my latest solar-powered aeroplane and upgraded it with a much improved electronic system, yeah. ideal for long-duration missions. I've been working on this complicated engineering challenge for a few months now, trying to build a solar-powered <laughs> RC plane with the ultimate goal of generating more power than it consumes to stay airborne. But the first test flight didn't end too well, as the onboard electronics failed mid-flight, causing the plane to come crashing back down. Some of our electronics might have just gone a bit wrong. <laughs> After that devastating crash, we had to find out what had caused it. So we would carry out an air crash investigation, develop a new, more reliable power system, and completely rebuild the plane before thoroughly testing it out both on the ground and in the air to see if we'd made progress towards our ambitious target. Straight after the crash, we jumped into a thorough investigation to pinpoint the exact cause of the disaster. The plane had a fairly complex power system. First of all, the cells were attached to the MPPT charge controller, which managed how much power was sent through to the main flight battery to keep it charged up at the optimal rate. The battery power was then routed back through the MPPT to the rest of the RC electronics that you would usually find in an RC plane. We carefully recreated the conditions of the failed test flight to see if we could replicate the problem. That's when we discovered something quite alarming. Oh, there we go. A built-in battery disconnect feature that we'd been completely unaware of. Because we hadn't done any proper bench testing before our first flight, we had no idea that this feature even existed. As the battery has steadily discharged, with the sun levels being quite low by the time of the crash, the MPPT decided to shut off, causing the plane to shut down mid-air and fall out of the sky. So the big question was, could we design a simpler system without this point of failure? With this, I was thinking, solar panel, and then that would then go into the input of a voltage regulator. Helpfully for us, Matt from the YouTube channel DIY Perks came to lend a hand. If you've watched Matt's channel, you'll know he's just completed building the world's largest iPhone, so it's safe to say he's pretty skilled when it comes to electronics. Matt had the bright idea of using a voltage regulator set to output the same voltage as the 4-cell LiPo flight battery, which would completely eliminate the need for an active charge controller. The way this system would work would be much simpler than before. Power from the solar cells would go to the voltage regulator, which would then send a steady 16.7 volts to the battery. And this battery was wired in parallel with the rest of the RC electronics. When the motor isn't running, power is drawn directly to the battery. When the motor is running, power is drawn to the motor, with the excess going to the battery. It was a super simple way of charging a battery, as the differential voltage between the battery as it started to discharge, and the 16.7 volts from the regulator, would naturally ensure that it was kept top up at all times as long as the motor wasn't drawing too much power. To test all of this out on the bench, we used a higher voltage lithium polymer battery to charge the smaller 4-cell battery. So it is charging it, the voltages are equalising. I feel that that's fairly normal. We are charging that LiPo from that one. So if this was solar, that would be literally charging from the sun. That's good! That's looking good. We still needed to test all of this properly with the cells to gather more data about the charge rate of the battery while the motor was running at different throttle settings. But now we had a power solution that we felt very confident in. Meanwhile, I had been hard at work for a good few days building a completely new airframe, which would become the Solar 3, which was to the same design as the Solar 2. This was now fitted with the new power system, ready for thorough testing to see if anything else would break while the plane was still on the ground. Another giant aircraft emerges from the uh, Project Air workshop. So this is the bench testing bit. So we're gonna run the motor at full power and then we'll be able to put it in the, in the air and, and trust that it's everything's going to work and nothing's going to brown out or blow up. Goggling up. Goggling up. Go. Although we weren't running the plane with the solar cells attached to charge the battery, here we were simply testing if the motor, battery and ESC were all operating as expected. After about 10 minutes of full throttle testing, we discovered a problem with the ESC as it started to restrict the power to the motor. Well, we're having a few problems. The motor is doing some weird things, so uh, not really sure why. This might have been the cause of one of the issues we'd seen with the Solar 2, when it started to lose power mid-flight, before its complete shutdown. The solution was simple. We just needed to use a bigger, higher amperage ESC. Okay, so this is the first test with the new, new ESC. 
After around 30 minutes of continuous running, we didn't see any more issues, and the electronics were now working perfectly. We kept testing all day to make absolutely sure that nothing else would break or overheat. Right, now that we'd proven that the power system worked on the ground, it was time to put it in the air for the first time. Right then, so this is the very first test of the Solar 3 as a bare bones aeroplane, just to see if it actually flies and if the autopilot and the GPS and all of that stuff's happy. Yeah, the weather is actually perfect for the Solar mission today. So unfortunately we're a bit behind schedule because later in the week might be worse for doing Solar stuff. Let's crack on. We needed to gather data about how much power the plane needed to stay airborne, as this would be crucial later for determining how fast the solar cells could charge the battery while in flight, which would allow us to run simulations of long duration missions while on the ground. I'd also changed a few things about the design of the plane since the crash, and one major change was to do with the length of the fuselage. The extended tail of the fuselage would hopefully help to get the centre of gravity right, but also make hand launching safer by keeping the propeller further away from the person throwing it. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. So I'm gonna go three, two, one, go, and that's when you run forward. Three, two, one, go. The moment it took off, I knew the CG wasn't quite right. I had to let the autopilot take over to keep it under control. Fly by wire, on. Yep, right, fine. It's getting blown by the wind a lot. Good news is fly by wire is working quite well. Bad news is it's oscillating a lot, I think with this breeze. At around 75% throttle, the plane could maintain altitude, but the wings were flexing like crazy. Every gust of wind sent it into a violent wobble. I was on the edge the entire time, fearing that the foam wing would snap under the stress. Previously, the plane had only been flown in completely still conditions, but now the five to six mile an hour breeze was looking like it might shake the plane apart in the air. This wasn't ideal at all. We might have just discovered a pretty fatal flaw with this giant wing design. I was starting to realise that perhaps a large high aspect ratio flying wing might not be the most practical or reliable testbed for our solar plane programme. The good news was that we had confirmed that the plane was able to fly at 75% throttle, even in this wind. Now it was time for a bit of an emergency landing. I'm going to have to have a very fast landing. Did you hear the noise it made? <laughs> Look at my hands. Uh. <laughs> I think the so the breeze is making it bounce up and down a lot. I think because of the uh, the wing, and then I think also it was just too tail heavy. Ah, oh, that's not good. That's quite worrying, really, because. Yeah. After a very tense test flight, I'd managed to bring the plane down safely, but we had a big problem. Would I be able to fix the wing flex issue? The motor mount had also snapped off, so this was one part of the design that I'd need to make a bit stronger. I hopped onto my Mac and got to work modifying the part on SolidWorks, which is the software I originally designed it in. SolidWorks are the sponsors of this week's video, by the way. Modifying the part was just a simple case of adding a fillet to the 90 degree bend. And this was done really quickly and efficiently in XDesign, the browser-based design tool from SolidWorks. And yes, this is all running on a Mac. If you don't know already, SolidWorks have just made a new package called SolidWorks for Makers to provide professional grade tools for not for commercial use hobbyists and personal projects limited to a maximum of $2,000 profit per year. You can design parts in the software and then 3D print them, just like I do. And all of this is for just $48 a year or $15 a month. For that, you'll get a complete software package and access to online support and design communities. SolidWorks now supports Mac and Chromebook users with 100% cloud-based apps, so there's nothing to download or install as everything's done in the cloud. The package includes the X Design app and the 
3DX Shape app, which can be used to sculpt 3D shapes and surfaces. You can, of course, still download 3D Experience SolidWorks just as before for Windows-based PCs. And with these, you can save locally or online with data management capability available on the cloud. There's a massive amount included in the SolidWorks for Makers package, so you should definitely check it out with the link in the description after this video and see if it's a good fit for your own projects. Now let's get this fitted to the aeroplane. Choose SolidWorks to elevate your maker game without compromise and within your means. Click the link in the video description below to get 20% off. We had discovered a few key issues with the flying wing that we would need to fix before the next test flight. The wings were bouncing around all over the place when we were doing that test flight and I think I'm going to do what I should have done from the start and actually use some of these which are big aluminium uh, L brackets and uh, just slide them up the wings and hopefully that will stiffen up the whole sort of cantilever design. Thing is, these wings have just got a foam board spar in and that's not strong enough, it's, it's too flexible. Adding aluminium would increase the all up weight of the aircraft by 700 grams. And that's no small amount when every gram counts. The plane was starting to feel too beefy and it was all a bit of a far cry from the sleek, efficient solar aircraft we'd originally envisioned. Okay, now that we had the changes all made, it was now time to install the cells on the top of this new aircraft to finish up the Solar 3 for some final bench testing as a complete aircraft. Could we simulate full flights of the aeroplane on the ground to prove that it would create more power than it would use? We wanted to find the charge rate of the battery at different throttle settings and observe the flow rate to the battery. After many hours of testing on the bench, we gathered lots of helpful data until the light started to fade. See that? 16.1. So yeah, we're running at half power, or well, about 40% 40, 40 throttle at the moment, and the battery is going up, so that's a good thing. From the results of all of this, we could plot a simple graph to show the performance of the cells feeding the battery through the voltage regulator while running the motor. The results showed that we would maintain battery voltage at around 85% throttle and start charging the battery with throttle settings under that level. Our calculations had paid off and we'd proved that the plane could sustain flight on solar power alone with this electronic setup if we could use less than 85% throttle while in the air to cruise around. We knew the plane had previously flown at around 75% percent throttle, but would adding the heavy aluminium to strengthen the wings, combined with more drag from the solar cells, have changed that. There's only so much you can test on the ground, so it was now time for the next test flight. We waited weeks for some half decent weather, but finally a day came with some sun and winds under 10 miles an hour. Right, it's uh, a bit cloudy, but it's good enough for our next test. And that is a test just to prove that the cells are doing something and that we can extend our flight time. If we can do that, then I'll consider it a win and we can move on with the next bit of the solar plane program. Now we just needed to get the heavy plane into the sky. Would it fly or would we be in for another crash? Yep, okay. Three, two, one, go. After an excellent hand launch from Emma, the plane was up and circling the field. The conditions were quite breezy, so I was thankful that okay. the wing was much stiffer than before. The purely foam wing would probably have folded in this kind of turbulence. I was finding it quite difficult to climb. I felt like the plane wasn't wanting to ascend at all, even on 100% throttle. I'm flying at full throttle right now. I'm gonna try and get altitude, but I'm in a bit of a dip here. I'm gonna try and get a bit higher into this wind, but I'm at full whack right now, full power, and that's not gonna be doing very well at all for our solar battery charging. I'm bringing it around. I've, I've gained a bit of altitude now, so I'm feeling a bit happier. Oh, 
it's very difficult to keep coordinated in turns. Fighting the wind, the large plane with its very slow roll rate was quite a handful to fly, and I was having to make control input several seconds ahead of time to give the giant aircraft enough time to respond. Just going to keep trying to circle it around here, gaining a bit of altitude, trying to roll out. So I'm going to go fly by wire now. Good news is the plane isn't wobbling anymore, so those upgrades with the aluminium have done wonders. I'm going to keep it within our fields, just coordinating it around. Unfortunately, I still wasn't that high up. Finding it quite difficult to turn downwind. And then I Ooh. made a big piloting mistake. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I left it too late to tell the plane to turn, and as it went behind the trees, I lost sight of it completely. I can't see it anymore. Relying on the onboard computer to keep the plane level, I cranked it around, but then Me had either. no time to roll out as it reappeared. Oh god, I'm going towards the trees. <laughs> the plane had been locked into a turn, and with its even worse performance than on previous test flights, had no chance of getting out of that rapidly approaching spiral of doom. Oh, I got into a flat spin. Ah. <laughs> no, we made it too heavy. The plane's just got such bad performance now. No power whatsoever. We need like two of those motors on it. And yeah, obviously it's not going to make the power for that from the cells. So <sighs> after recovering the wreckage, the plane could be dropped off in the Project Air workshop for evaluation. Was this wing savable or was it best to start work on a brand new plane? Right, well the good news is that this wing is actually completely intact, it's completely survived. The only thing that's really wrong with it is that it's too heavy. I can't really make it lighter now because the wing spar is completely glued in and everything. We knew that this plane design was inherently flawed, so we started to explore other ideas for the next phase of our solar plane program. One direction was to collect all of the cells into a smaller delta configuration, which would have more drag than a high aspect ratio flying wing, but could be made lighter. The other direction that we were interested to explore was to use fewer solar cells fitted to a more efficient aircraft that doesn't need half the power to stay airborne. I've already started to experiment with RC gliders, combining two ready-to-fly gliders together to create a twin fuselage configuration with lots of wing area for around 32 cells creating about 115 watts of power. Going this route would require changing our power system though, so we would probably end up going down the delta wing route. We'd achieved our goal of building a great power system that could sustain power easily. Now we just needed to design a better aircraft to put it on. Now the big problem with this solar project is that the weather is now really bad. So what I'm going to be doing is working on the DIY solar plane program in the background over the long term, rather than trying to get these videos out month by month. So you can look forward to a different project on Project Air next month on a brand new engineering challenge. Make sure to subscribe down here so that you don't miss that next video video and also here's another video in the meantime that you can be watching over here um, if you've got to the end of this video I think you'll enjoy this one so yes thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video cheerio